Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson, we're actually going to be starting or well, restarting to revise our chemistry because obviously we need to prepare for um, our final exam in chemistry, which you guys are doing on the, let me get this right, the 18th of November. Right, so the first thing that we're going to do is just go through a whole bunch of old IB papers. Well, when I say old, they're not that old. They're actually from this year um, for the, from the prelim papers, okay? So that's what we're going to do to make sure that you guys are totally prepared. Right, so let's get started. It says, we've got, this is a typical way that these questions start. We've got um, an organic chemistry question. There's butane 2 o and then there's the Ku structure here, which is carboxylic acid. There is single bonded thing with an OH. There is CH2 double bonded with the CH and the CL. There's a CH3, CH2C, and then a double bonded O there. And another branch over here, possibly. Well, that is definitely a branch because that's a functional group. And then yes, also a double bonded O and an O. And then there's 4 methyl pentanoic acid, which is an ester. There's pentanol, there's a hydroxyl again, and there's C4H8. Okay, so what I am just done is what I would suggest you guys do when you are actually um, doing your reading time, okay? You guys really need to make sure that you use your reading time. I see a lot of students when I'm invigilating and they're just sitting there um, staring into space. I don't know if they're just trying to get their thoughts together or if they're too scared to open the paper, but it's really silly because be delaying it by that extra 10 minutes is not actually going to make it less scary to open the paper. And when you're reading the paper, you're actually gaining time. I mean, there's a reason that the Department of Education has given you that extra time. It's because they know that it takes time to read questions. And a lot of time when you start reading the questions, you might read this question and go, oh my word, I don't know what's going on. Um, and then when you start doing the questions and it little plays in the back of your mind a little bit, okay? And then suddenly when you get to the question, you go, oh, of course, yes, okay? And I'm not making this stuff up. I've had that happen to me several times and I've had students describe that happen to them. So please guys read the questions. We don't waste reading time. Okay, now it says choose from a list of the substance that is used in the laboratory in the preparation of F. Okay, wait, choose from the list a substance that is used in the preparation of F. Write down only the letter only, okay? So they want to know which of these things here can be used to make F. Now, F is an ester. Do you agree? There's two carbons, an O, and then a C is a double bonded OH. So what do we have there? We have definitely got an ester made up of an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. Now the alcohol, if we had to name this ester, it would be ethyl and then it would be methanoate, methanoate, which means that we started off with ethanol and methanoic acid, methanoic acid. So what we need to be looking for here is seeing if any of these things are either ethanol and or methanoic acid. Now I know this is a carboxylic acid functional group, it's C double bonded OOH, but that doesn't mean it's methanoic acid because there's a little line here. And that line means it could either be C is here or an H here. If it was an H, then yes, it'd be methanoic acid. And then we could call it that, but no. This little line here tells you that you're joining other stuff. Yeah, we've got butane 2 ol it's none of those two. This ethanol has got two carbons in the hydroxyl group, okay? And methanoic acid has got one carbon and your Ku structure. So that's way too big, that's not it. That's way too big, that's not it, that's not it. Two. Aha, I, the letter is I. I is ethanol ethanol. And another thing I want to point out here is that they've made a mistake. 
Do you see that, yeah, this hydroxyl group is not got a little line between the O and the H, whereas this hydroxyl group has got a line between the O and the H. Now, if you draw your hydroxyl groups or your methyl groups with, okay, admittedly, this is a condensed structural formula, so that's fine. But if you draw your, any of your hydroxyl groups like this with just OH, then instead of O-H, okay, you are going to be marked down for the simple reason that they have decided that people need to show that they know that oxygen's got two arms, not the hydrogen. Now it says, which one of the above represents a secondary alcohol? Okay, now a second for tertiary alcohol, no first, let me try again. A primary al alcohol is one that's on the end. Okay, the carbon has to be, the oxygen, the hydroxyl group has to be on the end. A secondary hydroxyl group is one where it's got a carbon, it's joined into a carbon that it belongs to at least one of the carbon. Okay, in other words, a secondary alcohol does this. There's a hydroxyl group here, and then that hydroxyl carbon belongs to at least one other carbon, okay? Whereas, I mean, two other carbons, where that's a secondary. A tertiary is C dash C dash C dash C dash O dash H, okay? So we're looking for something that looks like that, where it's not on the end. So a secondary alcohol is basically an alcohol where the hydroxyl group is not on the end. So this here is a primary because the hydroxyl group is at the end. This here, this carbon, there is an hydroxyl group, but this carbon is joined onto one, two, three. So that's actually a tertiary. So the possibility is that this here might be our secondary, but we have to draw it out just to make sure. So butane 2 all looks like this. It's one, two, three, four. And then on the second carbon, there's a hydroxyl group. So this carbon belongs to two other carbons, so that is right, and this is secondary. So the correct answer for this would be A. Okay, right. Um, guys, obviously I'm taking a little bit longer to get to the answer because I'm explaining it, okay? If you just automatically can see that that is a secondary, then obviously you don't have to write all this extra in. This is just showing you how we get it by get the answers. It says write down the name of compound D, D. Okay, so this is an interesting compound because it's got two carbons in it. So we know it's S. Okay, it's got a double bond, so it's ethene. You don't need to name it, obviously, because there's only two, chlor two carbons in it. But there's a chlorine on it, so this is chloro ethene and again you don't have to name it where the carbon what on which carbon the chlorine belongs because either way would work so this is going to be chloroethene chloroethene now it says write down the letter that represents an aldehyde now an aldehyde has a double bonded o on the end Okay, it also has the name ending with, instead of alcohol, it ends in L, okay, like methanol, propanol, okay, do you understand that? So, let's have a look. Yeah, we've got a double bonded O on the end. Okay, that would work. You also have pentanol. Um... Double bond, yeah, hide end. So actually, you could write either E or you could write H. Okay, either E or H would work. Now it says write down the molecular series to which compound B belongs. Okay, well, I've mentioned that a couple of times. 2.5, it is a carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid. Okay, then 2.6, it says draw the structural formula of compound G. So compound G is a 4-methyl pentanoic acid. So it's saying that there's a methyl group on the fourth carbon of the pentanoic acid. So we've got C, 2, 3, 
four, five, that's your pent, your five carbons for your pentanoic acid. Okay, then we've got the carbox silic group acid, so it's, it's double bonded O, OH. Now we count from that side because this is the functional group, so it's good. one, two, three, four, and on that carbon there is a methyl group. And guys, I know it's boring, but you guys have to have to draw your hydrogens in. I know it's tedious and boring, and you might think to yourself, well, how do they, why don't they know that obviously these have got hydrogens in? They do know, they're making sure that you know. Okay, so that there is a structural formula of compound G. Now it says draw the structural formula of the functional, of the functional group of compound H. Oh, sneaky, sneaky people. So the functional group of compound H would be C double bonded O H dash R. In other words, which we're showing is that the double bonded O is on the end. Okay, there's an H here because it is a pentanyl. I mean, pentanyl is an aldehyde. Aldehyde. Okay, the other version, of course, is a ketone where the double bonded O is in the middle, and then, of course, this would also be an R. But by doing an H here, you're showing that it's on the last carbon. Sure, okay, let's move on. It says the boiling point of methane is minus 161 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point of pentane is 36 degrees Celsius. Okay, so methane has got one carbon, and pentane's got five, but they're both alkanes. And remember what type of bonding do alkanes have got? The weak. We don't call them van der Waals forces anymore. They, we call them London forces. Weak London forces. Okay. It says, Pen 10, comments by Rama, a grade 12 learner. He says, he or she says, Pen 10 has a longer carbon chain than methane, which is true. Therefore, more bonds need to be broken to separate the molecule into individual atoms. Okay, but that's got nothing to do with boiling. Breaking of these bonds requires energy, which explains why pentane has a higher boiling point than methane. It consider Rama's explanation, explain why it is incorrect. The reason it's incorrect is because when you, you're just changing phase, you're not actually breaking the bonds. If you're breaking the bonds, you would be changing it into different substance. So therefore, I could say that the reason it's incorrect is because there is only a phase change. There is only a phase change. Okay, no bonds are broken. Okay, there are intermolecular forces that come into play, but there are no bonds broken. Then it says, provide a correct explanation for the difference in boiling points. It is true that pentane has longer main chain. Therefore, there are stronger intermolecular forces. Therefore, more energy is required to um, separate the molecules and uh, cause the phase change, to cause the phase change. Okay, now it says write in the name and draw the structural formula of an isomer of pentane that will have a lower boiling point than pentane. Okay, well, it's really easy. We could say 2 methylbutane, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2 methylbutane, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12. So, um, the reason, or you could even say one, two, three, carbon, carbon. Basically, any 
isomer. Now remember an isomer is something that has the same number of carbons and the same number of hydrogen. So you need C6H14, six carbons, sorry, my bad. You've got C5H12. Um, so you've got five carbons and 12 hydrogens. That's all you need, five carbons and 12 hydrogens. If you've got that, it's an isomer, okay? So any isomer of pentane, which has got a shorter main chain, will have a lower boiling point. And the reason for that is because obviously then there are weaker land forces. It says draw the structural formula of the positional isomer of butanein. So all that is means that we are doing exactly the same thing as butanein, except now we're changing with a double bond is. So it would be C dash C double bond C dash C. That's the only positional isomer there is because I'm going to move it back up here. Then we're back to butanein where this is but to in. Okay, happy with that. Right, and I have been lazy and I haven't put my hydrogens in for any of these drawings, but you guys have to do it. Okay, that's teacher prerogative to not put the hydrogens in, but you have to. Right, let's have a look. Do you notice that we're doing some more questions on the um, on organic chemistry? A very large, large part of your um, organic chemistry is going to be, I mean, of your exam paper is going to be organic chemistry. So you need to be aware of that all the time, okay? Um, okay, so let us carry on now. It says the following graph shows the relationship between vapor pressure of organic molecules and temperature. Okay, now let's think about this. What is vapor pressure? Vapor pressure is the pressure that we find above the surface of a liquid. Okay, so if a liquid evaporates easily, okay, so let me draw something for you. Let's say we've got a little beaker. Okay, and you've got, it's a terrible drawing, I know, and you've got a liquid in this beaker, right? Then what happens is as this liquid evaporates, it forms vapor. Now, depending on how strong the intermolecular forces are, the vapor might have lots of energy or very little energy as it breaks free, okay? If the bonds are very strong, okay, in other words, this requires a lot of energy to break free, then the little particles are not gonna have much energy once they've broken free from the liquid. And what's going to happen is that they're going to hang just above the surface of the liquid, okay? And then they're going to cause what is called vapor pressure, the pressure of the vapor on the surface. Now, if there is a high vapor pressure, it means that there are strong intermolecular forces, okay? Strong intermolecular forces. Okay, whereas if there's a low vapor pressure, it means that these particles have managed to escape totally and therefore there's a weak intermolecular force. Okay, happy with that. Right, now let's see what they're talking about. It says it's a relationship between the vapor pressure of organic molecules and the temperature. So this is the vapor pressure of different ones and this is the temperature. And it says the four curves A, B, C, D represent organic molecules belonging to the following homologous series. An unbranched alkane, a branched alkane, an unbranched primary alcohol, and an unbranched aldehyde. All four molecules have the same carbon, the same number of carbon atoms. Okay, so we're looking at an alkane, an unbranched, so it's a straight chain, straight. Then a branched, branched alkane. Okay, right, you're happy. Then you've got an unbranched primary alcohol, primary alcohol. Okay, and then you've got an unbranched aldehyde. Okay, so let's think about this. The, alcohol, the alkanes only have London forces. Okay. And the branched one is weaker than the unbranched thin straight chain because it's got a greater surface area. This has got a hydrogen bond 
and this has got a double bonded O, so therefore it's heavier. And it's also got some hydrogen bonds, but the alcohol wins. So if I had to do um, the weakest to the strongest with regards to intermolecular forces, it would be branched alkane. Then it would be, is going to be less strong as the straight chain alkane straight alkane which is then going to be the unbranched aldehyde oh can't spell which is then going to be the alcohol the alcohol is going to have the strongest the very strongest intermolecular forces okay so as far as i'm concerned that is the order from weakest to strongest of the intermolecular forces okay so that's another type of thing admittedly you wouldn't write it down but that's another type of thing that you could look at and think about while you do have your reading time now it says define, define the term homologous series guys you need to go look at your exam guidelines they've got a perfect definition of the homologous series Series. Um, but basically it is a certain type of molecule where they belong to certain they're the same functional group and they are separated or differ from each other but one CH2 um, compound okay it's that type of thing which one of the following curves a b c d represents the straight chain alkane okay so let's have a look this is the vapor pressure it starts at 20 40 60 80 100 okay so you want the one the straight chain is going to be the one that's got the lowest vapor pressure the straight chain is going to have the lowest vapor pressure actually no the branch chain sorry sorry my bad the branch chain is going to have the lowest vapor pressure and the straight chain is going to be the second lowest. Okay, the second lowest. So do you agree that yeah, the vapor pressure is more or less the same for both of these two, but yeah, you can see it's definitely lower than that one even as the temperature increases. So I would say that the straight, that the single branched alkane is going to be D and that the straight chain is going to be C, okay? So it's fully explain your choice in by referring to tab, and I've just spoken about that already. I've said about the fact that the branch chain and straight alkanes have both got very weak London forces, and they're much weaker than the aldehydes and alcohols. Alcohol's got a hydroxyl group, and this has got a double bonded O, so they both have hydrogen bonding, but the alcohol's got two times hydrogen bonding with the aldehyde in years one. So therefore, this is, these two are going to be the weakest when it comes to the types of intermolecular forces. But the branch chain is even weaker than the straight chain for the simple reason that it's got a greater surface area. Or you could think of it as because its branch has got a shorter main chain. Now it says, which one of the following curves ABCD represents the primary alcohol and the aldehyde? So the primary alcohol would be A then and the aldehyde would B, B. There you go. A group of 12 learners that are in a school lab preparing an ester using methanol and ethanoic acid. The balanced chemical equation for this reaction is given below. So this is methanol. Okay, and this here is your ethanoic acid. It says write down the IUPAC name of the ester. Okay, so methanol becomes methyl methyl and ethanoic acid becomes ethanoate ethanoate okay now it says 50 grams of impure 50 grams of impure methanol re fully reacts with excess ethanoic acid it produces 68,8 grams of your methyl ethanoate Calculate the percentage purity of the methanol. Okay, right. So we know it has produced 68.8 grams of your methyl ethanoate, your ester. And do you notice that this is stoichiometry? And 
you'll notice that there hasn't been in last year's exams there wasn't as much stoichiometry whereas in these exams this year it seems that stoichiometry has become the flavor of the month again so you really need to make sure you know how to do your stoichiometry okay okay right so I'm going to write out the equation here so that we can look at it properly. We've got CH4O plus C2H4O2 goes to C3H6O2 plus H2O. We formed 68,8 grams of this stuff, okay? But we can't compare things with masses. What do we need? We need moles. So what we need to do is we need to find the number of moles formed. The number of moles of C3H6O2. And the way we do that is take our mass and divide it by the molar mass. The molar mass. So let's do that. We've got 68,8 divided by the molar mass. Now, you guys, I've said to you a million times already, when you're busy studying science, you need to have with you um, your formula sheet, your periodic table, your redox table, and your um, calculator, pen, pencil, ruler. Okay. That's what you need, and paper, obviously. Obviously, you need paper. Okay, right, so now, so what I want you guys to do is get out your periodic table and let us work out the molar mass. So, we have got three times carbon plus six times hydrogen plus two times oxygen, okay? Which gives you 68,8 over three times 12 is 36 plus 6 plus 2 times 16 is 32, which is 68,8 divided by 36 plus 38. So now I need a calculator. Dum, dum, dum. Thank you. So therefore we can set 68, oh, let's just clear that, sorry, 68.88 divided by, that is what? That is 74. 74 equals 0.93 moles. So that gives us 0.93 moles, okay? So 0.39 moles of the methyl ethanoate were formed, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna erase all the ink, that'd be horrible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, fine. We know that therefore that this equals 0.93 moles, right? This equals 0.93 moles. Now what we need to do is find out how many moles we started with. So again, we're going to go number of moles is mass over the molar mass, which is 50 divided by 12 plus 4 plus 16, which is 50 divided by 32. Okay, that's 20 plus 12 is 32. So we go 50 divided by 32, and that gives us 1.56, which is 1,56 moles. So do you agree we started with 1.56 moles, but we only ended up with 0.93 moles? But do you see the ratio is 1 to 1? So what we're saying is that if we made 0.93 moles, we actually only used up 0.93 moles. So that, but we've used it up totally, okay? So therefore there's nothing left, which means the rest wasn't used to produce this, so it wasn't pure. So we could say that 0, 0.93 over the 1,56, this is what's pure out of the 1,56. So we have to times it by 100 over 1. So we're going to go 0, 0.9, 0, 0.93 divided by 1,56 equals multiplied by 100. Really? equals 
equals 59,60%. So therefore, the percentage purity of the methanol is 59,60%. So what we're saying is 59.60% of the original sample was converted into methyl ethanoate. The rest, the rest was actually um, used up, but it wasn't actually, didn't actually make methyl ethanoate. So therefore, it was impure. Right, let us move on to the next question. Okay, so now we're looking at reactions. Okay. Huh. Okay, so we're looking at reactions. Okay, let's go through it. So we've got, where's A? Oh, there's A. Okay, so we've got, yeah, is an ester. Do you see it? That's two carbons and oxygen double bonded O. That's the ester linkage. That's ester plus water, okay? Here is alcohol. It seems like B is kind of your central point and that there is ethanol. Ethanol. Okay, before we read the questions, I just want to see what's going on here. We use the ethanol to make ethanoic, I mean to make ethyl, ethyl propanoic acid. So that's esterification. Esteri Okay. Yeah, we've had some substitution happen. Do you agree? We've changed this hydroxyl. And remember what I said to you? That's wrong. It needs to be O H. Okay. So we've changed the hydroxyl group for the chlorine. So that is a substitution reaction. Okay. Then we've gone from this is ethene. Okay. And yeah, we took our ethene and there we burnt it to form carbon dioxide and water. So this is called oxidation. And to get from the C double bonded, um, the ethene to the hydrox to the alcohol, that's obviously going to be hydration. Right? Do you agree? Because we're adding an ox a water to get that, the hydroxyl group. Um, and to get from the hydroxyl group back down to double bonded would be dehydration. One of the addition reactions and elimination reactions. It says, name the type of reaction indicated by A, C, D, and E. Okay, so A is going to be hydration because you're going to add a water to this. It'll then add the hydroxyl group and a hydrogen. Yes, that's right. C is substitution because we're substituting the chlorine for the hydroxyl group. D is dehydration because we're going in the opposite direction and back to the ethene. And E is oxidation or you could even call it combustion. You're burning it to form carbon dioxide and water. Done. Okay, the product of reaction C Yes, can be converted by single reaction to D, to, to the product of reaction D. Ah, there. Okay, right. So we're saying that we could take out a chlorine and a hydrogen to get the double bonded thing. Yes. State the necessary reagents and conditions for this condition for this reaction. Okay, so let's just talk about what this reaction is actually doing. This reaction is taking out the chlorine and the hydrogen and replacing it with the just the double bonded carbon. Okay, do you see that? So what are we doing? We're going, I'm just going to show you, it's C-C-Cl with the hydrogens. And what are we doing? We're removing one of the hydrogens and a chlorine. So we end up with a double, actually no, we're doing this. We're taking away a chlorine. Sorry, just having a second. We're not doing that one. And we're, remember it's three dimensional, okay? We're taking away this hydrogen and we end up with C double bonded C, hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. So that's an elimination reaction, do you agree? That is an elimination reaction because we're eliminating the chlorine and the hydrogen to give you 
an alkene and it's called dehydrohalogenation. Let me write that down for you. It's called dehydrohalogenation because you're moving a hydro, the hydrogen, and you're moving, removing a halogen. And for this to occur, you need to have reflux. Okay, it has to have re with concentrated either sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide in ethanol. In ethanol. Guys, this the square brackets actually mean concentration, but I get a bit lazy when I write these things out. So instead of writing concentration, I write just put the brackets for concentrated. So dehydrohalogenation takes place under the reflux, under reflux with sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide in ethanol. That's what removes the this hydrogen chloride and gives you um, just the ethene alkene. Okay. Now it says reactions B and D, B and D, right, oh, sorry, B and D, um, use the same catalyst, write down the name or formula of this catalyst, that's sulfuric acid. The reason it's sulfuric acid or H2SO4 is because it removes water. It is a catalyst, but it's also a dehydrating agent. So what happens is when you use a catalyst or sulfuric acid, it removes the hydroxyl group in the water and similarly here. Yeah. So this product of reaction D, this thing here, can undergo polymerization. Name the polymer that would be produced. Okay, so the type of polymerization it would undergo would be addition polymerization because addition requires a double bond, okay? And since this is ethene, the polymer would be polyethene, polyethene. Now it says, using condensed formula, write a balanced reaction for the combustion of ethanol. Okay, so that's totally different. So let us look at the combustion of ethanol. So let's just erase the link. Ethanol is C C, condensed, it says condensed formula. I just want to write, uh, okay, fine. So it's going to be C ethanol. There's ethanol there. Uh, just erase this. It says condensed formula. So we just want the fact that it's going to be C2 H 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 O plus oxygen is going to form carbon dioxide plus water. Okay. And now we need to balance it. So let's see, we've got two carbons here. So we need to put a big two there, right? Then we have got six hydrogens here, so I'm going to put a big three here. Now if we multiply this out, do you agree that that gives me four, and that gives me three, that gives me seven, okay? There is one oxygen here, so if I multiply this by three, I will have six oxygens plus one is seven. And there you go, I've got my balanced equation, balanced reaction for the combustion of ethanol. Right, grade 12, we will stop there and we will start with this question when we start again on Monday. Have a great weekend and study well. Cheers.